will bring to, um, everyone's attention networks because they usually do not get um, uh, that um, space and attention, whether it is from, from funders or um, um, other change makers. So you will see that amongst yourselves, the different um, participants um, and speakers being uh, network coordinators, uh, but also um, leaders, funders, um, and in addition to our online events that you um, are able to uh, participate in, but also get access to the recordings of, um, we are also encouraging our partners um, to share their in-person events. So it has been quite a diverse um, set of sessions and speakers. This is just a, a quick snapshot of what you um, could have seen. And there are a few more uh, coming up for the rest of this week and uh, Monday, Tuesday next week um, with different types of formats. And today we will be actually in the format of storytelling. Uh, but there have also been, for example, pitch practices um, where uh, network leaders are able to get feedback from funders about how they're representing the networks, among others. And these are the different topics as well that uh, we have covered so far later this week. For example, we are also going to be talking about networks in the education space, um, for example, for um, teachers and students. So hopefully you have uh, found something that is of interest to you um, throughout the festival. So without uh, much further background, I'm very um, happy to welcome our speakers for today's session where we'll be talking about gender equity. Um, and uh, the storytelling format, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to witness it um, yet, uh, we will have our speakers um, uh, share their kind of introductory remarks um, and engage a little bit of a discussion afterwards. Um, and then in about 40 minutes, um, we will be opening um, or we're taking a break and open the chat to all of you to share your reflections and your questions and comments to what you have heard. So um, for the first you know, half hour or so, uh, we encourage you to actively listen um, and then engage um, in the kind of halfway through the, the session. Um, and our speakers will be um, then uh, responding to um, to your comments as well, and we will have a little bit of an engagement uh, from that perspective. Um, so, without further ado then, I will yield the floor to our first um, speaker, who is going to be Elsa. So, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Elsa Marie De Silva, and I'm the founder of Red Dot Foundation. I live in Mumbai, India. And around 10 years ago, in December 2012, there was a horrific uh, incident that took place in India. A young woman was traveling on a bus with a male friend, and she was, they were both attacked. Her friend was beaten up and tied, while she was gang raped multiple times and then left to die on the streets. And that incident um, sparked outrage uh, in India as well as abroad. And, um, you know, everywhere you went, there were only uh, conversations about uh, this particular incident and made us reflect on uh, our own experiences of being sexually harassed in public spaces in public transportation. I was emotionally triggered, remembered my own stories of witnessing masturbation on a bus, being um, groped on a train and even being sexually harassed at the workplace. So um, along with my friends, I realized that not only were we triggered to remember our own memories, but also that none of us had actually spoken about it before this incident or made any official complaints. And therefore, what I realized, there was a data gap that existed. At the time, I was working in the aviation industry. I was working for one of India's largest airlines. I headed the network planning department where I was using a lot of data to make uh, business decisions on how to optimize resources, that is the planes. And um, so I tried to make sense of this particular social incident that occurred. And I wanted to understand what was the scope of the problem. I went to Google and typed in and all I could get was this one statistic, which is even till today used. One in three women on an average experience sexual violence around the world at least 
acts once in their lifetime. And yet 80% choose never to speak up or make an official complaint. And so uh, realizing that there is a data gap that exists, uh, I launched uh, a crowd map, um, Safe City. A crowd map is a platform on web and on mobile where anyone can anonymously document their personal experience of what happened to them, where it happened, the day of week, the time of day, and put a description of the incident and tick a few categories that uh, you know, best describe that incident. And with this data set, we were able to geotag these locations on the map so that we can visually see the patterns and trends emerging at a neighborhood level. Now, this is a completely new data set that does not exist. Because if you go to your country's uh, website for crime data, you will realize that there are statistics, but they don't really give you information that you could use in your own suburb, in your own neighborhood, or even at your city level. Whereas our data set will tell you a pattern and trend, like on Saturday at 2 p.m. at this street, corner, we have five incidents of, say, stalking. And with this information, we were able to mobilize communities, especially young people, to um, be socially brave, to not only break the silence around the issue because they realized they were not alone, also to reclaim their agency because every country, especially India, has laws that, that are supposed to prevent this violence and to redress the violence. But the problem is implementation of these laws. And with this data set, we have worked with communities, uh, that is young people on college campuses or community-based organizations in residential areas to work with authorities to fix some of the contributing factors. So some things could be fixing street lights, or it could be um, you know, a particular location like a public toilet where this is happening. So it's trying to understand what about that toilet complex is making this um, a vulnerable space. So it could be there are no doors or windows for lighting, or it could be uh, creating awareness, or it could even mean getting the police to change beat patrol timings. And what I've realized over the last 10 years is that information is key in helping people reclaim their agency, be socially brave, and then uh, work with that data set to build trust with the authorities and demand accountability. So I'm happy to share specific examples further, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Elsa, and uh, for sharing your own journey into starting your organizations and all the um, interesting work that you do with data to support change. Um, and, you know, as you would have seen that I put quickly in the chat as well, that, um, you know, throughout the session, you will be hearing some, you know, both personal stories or stories of the organizations, people who are part of uh, the organizations that are represented here, who, um, experience difficult situations and we as you know as we will be talking through um gender equity today you will see the complexity of it um and how it touches everyone um so um uh, just as a as a as a reminder for us all that it might be um, a lot of challenging conversations that you will be hearing today um and so so that you come into that space with that understanding so um thank you so much elsa for for starting us off um, I will now then invite our second speaker um, uh, uh, to the floor, and so uh, that is um, Kavya. So, over to you. Thank you, Yan, and thank you also for starting this off. Um, I'm Kavya, and I work with an organization called Niranta Trust in Delhi, India. Our office is in Delhi, but we work all over the northern uh, region. So we work in gender and education, um, and when I say gender, it doesn't mean that we work, you know, it's a subtopic of one of our programs or, you know, it's one theme that we want to touch, but all of our work, um, whether it's running learning centers or conducting trainings or capacity building of educators or capacity building of another organization, 
um, we use gender as a lens. So that's what I mean when we say that we work in gender. So we use it as a perspective of gender, sexuality, and more context-specific things like caste, class, religion, language, everything in India. So I primarily work with young people, um, out of school adolescent girls and very young adolescent girls and boys in urban slums. And all of these people are from the most marginalized communities in India, uh, from one of the most marginalized communities in India. So they belong to, you know, daily wage, daily wage working families or from, you know, uh, SCST communities or they're from a certain religion, uh, which is being discriminated against. So the background in itself is quite difficult and we run learning programs for them, which is one of our approach with them. So whenever these learners go through their learning program, um, you know, they've never been to school or they've maybe dropped out years ago. So whenever they go through this learning program, uh, they come out of it as a group. And we work on their solid on, you know, making sure that their solidarity is long lasting. So throughout our program, apart from engaging with them on an academic level, we uh, our curriculum which is based on gender and sexuality we use those skills and even add on more negotiation skills risk analysis skills and uh, being able to just identify their own needs desires being able to talk about themselves and then being able to communicate these needs and desires to the outside world and being able to vocalize what they're going through and what issues they're facing um, so these are some of the skill building things that we work on and then we focus on making sure that they understand that empowerment is not a, just an individual process or just a linear process. And that, you know, when I say linear, it doesn't mean that I will be empowered only if I'm being able to go out at night or doing whatever I want. Empowerment also means that I'm able to try to go out at night, that I'm able to negotiate. So even those things. So we try to instill these perspectives in them. And, you know, we want to encourage these young people to band together and then take their issues ahead. Because even though we as youth workers are not in the community all the time, these girls and boys will be there throughout. And they will take these learnings forward and actually implement them in their own life. I also wanted to just mention that when we work, when we say that, you know, we work with these uh, groups and we work, focus on gender and equity, it is again very context specific. So gender and gender based equity might mean something very different for young girls in Delhi, in a slum in Delhi, and it might mean something completely different in a village in the mountain, in the same country. So keeping that in mind as well, that even when we talk about gender, that it in itself is so uh, vast. And also it's not in binaries. I mean, I have been talking in binary for so long because we, most of our learners at the moment are cisgender folk. But uh, we need to keep in mind that, you know, gender is not binary. It's so much more than that. It's not just us being stuck in boxes. That's a much bigger conversation that we're having than we're having today. Um, but that's an important part of it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I would love to talk to everyone. Thank you so much, um, Kavya, for your opening remarks and telling us about Nirantar Trust. And um, I really appreciate, you know, kind of bringing into the conversation the process of empowerment and what does it mean? And I think that will be one of the themes that we will be talking about uh, together is this kind of role of networks and collaborations and solidarity and working together in order, for example, for that empowerment um uh to be realized beyond that individual uh individual level um so thank you so much um uh, for that um so now um again i'm very happy to now uh yield the floor to um sophia so you're next thank you uh so my name is sophia Strauss, and i work at the secretariat of manage europe uh, which is based in stockholm sweden and uh, first of all, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm looking forward to continue this discussion with you. And my story starts back in 2009, where uh, a number of members that, or like a number of people and individuals that participated in a gender equality conference uh, started to mingle around and realize that all of them had been struck by the same thought that it's to 
little conversation about like the men's responsibility in gender equality. And there are a few uh, coordinated efforts to come uh, to connect those that are seeing the same trend that men and boys are also um, should also be included and engaged in this effort that is not only a women's issue and that working with men and boys are addressing the root causes to an uh, unequal society but also a threat and risks for women so this group of individuals in the lobby at this conference started something that has now grown into a regional network and since then this network has uh, increased from a number of individuals that literally met in each other's kitchen when they followed up and slept in each other's living rooms in order to have their meetings have now grown into um, a regional network covering 33 European countries with 105 members, both organizations and individuals, and with uh, a secretariat based in Stockholm. Uh, so it's obviously the it becomes obvious that this was not only something isolated, but rather something that uh, was needed and had a fueling effect and a snowball effect. Now this regional network is also part of a global uh, men engage alliance covering the, the globe. So the European network is only one of six regional networks, which also paints a picture of how uh, important this question is that having men and boys included in the process of gender equality and maybe even underlining the relevance of connecting those organizations that do work with this. Um, so, I mean, may, in many contexts that we are in contact with, uh, especially in the European network, we see backlash in gender equality. We see how men are expected to, instead of caring about their children, going into military. And we still, still have those trends where men and boys constantly face uh, toxic masculinity norms, uh, which fuels them into a behavior which uh, they might not have chosen otherwise. So it's a societal change. It's a change of uh, masculinity norms from its core that is needed. It's a, it's a long process, but uh, we're slowly getting there. And what we can see as well is like many of our members, let's say in Eastern Europe or in the Southern Northern as well, feel very isolated when working on this issue because uh, the majority of everyone working with um, gender equality is of course uh, women and um, as it should be because it's close to our hearts um, but there are few organizations and few donors that see the value in merging and working both with women's rights organizations and organizations that work with women's rights through engaging men it's the same end goal uh, so those organizations many times feel isolated in their type of work and misunderstood um, and having a coordinated network where they can all like reach out uh, exchange methodologies exchange perspectives and just ventilate what they uh, the backlashes that they face the different personal experiences they have as well has been super valuable for many we've uh, meet people all the time in our digital or physical meetings that say that their uh, their motivation is fueled by having a network and a coordinated effort that brings them together to, to with other organizations that are dealing with similar uh, problems and have similarities and differences of course so what we do overall is could be described in four different uh, pillars. Uh, one is preventing gender-based violence and violence against children. The second is working with youth to redefine gender norms and violence and promote sexual health and rights. And third is promoting men's equitable fatherhood and caregiving. And fourth, improving health outcomes for women, children and men themselves. So uh, when doing that as a regional network, it really uh, yeah, creates bigger snowball effect for the whole continent, I guess. But I think my time is out there and I'll be happy to speak to more of you. Thanks so much, Sophia. And and I think there were a few a few things we will come back to, you know, because I think um, 
this kind of um, benefit of networks and collaboration to to target that isolation. Um, and you know, I think we heard also. Um, a little bit from uh, Kavya and Elsa that the kind of trust and relationship building in order to collaborate together is so important to to achieve the change, whether it is to kind of help young people, you know, in their own spaces or something more systematic or uh, on a larger scale. Um, but I think one of the things we are, have also kind of started to think about is this kind of taboo nature of some of this gender norm work and kind of the need to speak up and you know having that community that encourages you to speak out being so important so definitely we'll come back to unpack some of these further um, and I think the the nature of um, taboo issues around gender equality and equity is also the case for our final speaker so um, Vera um, over to you I look forward to hearing your um, opening story Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining. Uh, also thank you to the InHive team for the invitation to uh, come through today. So my name is Vera Habedi Malo. I work at Young Heroes. It's a local NGO uh, in Eswatini, Southern Africa. Um, mostly uh, Young Heroes started as an organization in 2006. Uh, in the hive of the pandemic of OVCs, uh, HIV. A lot of children were now uh, leading their child-headed households because their parents had died due to HIV. Uh, we grew and continued work. Uh, we still do continue work with OVCs, but we grew and also are now working with adolescent girls and young women um, because it's a patriarchal country and they are more, they are, girls and women are less disadvantaged. Um, even in finishing school, they are less disadvantaged. Even in work ratios, there are more men than women. So that's some of the work that we do. Uh, it's towards HIV prevention. We've incorporated now in our work, some of the things that Kavia and Elsa Marie were talking about, uh, developing uh, adolescent girls and young women for GPV and making sure that they are empowered, especially for their own health. Uh, but I think what's quite interesting that I wanted to share what we do is helping them with uh, economic, social economic interventions. So we've incorporated helping adolescent girls and young women to start businesses and to do vocational training and more so in their vocational training to look more than just um, what is, is for girls, because we are in that society, a, a still, still a step back uh, than, than in Europe and the, other, and the other areas in the West, you know, girls here, you are told you do the sewing, you do the catering. So we try to encourage them rather to go and look at other avenues, try your engineering, try your plumbing, try your construction work. And we create local networks for them within your community where they can go and find somebody else, whether it's a male or female or something, who's doing that business to encourage them to take it up and that yes, you can, uh, even though women don't necessarily do that. We also looking at, um, for those who've started business, creating networks, for them, not just um, within their communities, but uh, with like the ministries for those, I'll just give an example for those who are doing agriculture. There were some who wanted to start and do poultry. We've connected them with the ministry. Uh, we've connected them with markets, put them in simple things like WhatsApp groups where they can just interact and get help. Uh, and not go it alone as a woman who's in this business that is new. So they uh, have access to like a veterinarian, they have access to somebody else who's willing to help. So uh, yeah, the networks are, are really, really uh, important for us. Similarly, also with issues of um, GPV, there are other partners that we link to and we share information more on GPV. I also liked um, from Sophia's last one, we do also, not so much, but I'm stealing some ideas. Um, we do have interactions with leaders in the community who 90% of them are men to change gender norms for our young women. When they are grants, you find they go to the men. So we speak to them that how can they come in and be a party to helping, uh, especially the young women to get opportunities. So I'll stop right there. Thank you so much. 
Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your um, opening um, thoughts and sharing the experiences from the work that you do. Um, so we will now, uh, for you know, maybe five or seven minutes, just quickly follow up on each other. And I have a few questions I would love to pose, but before that, I will also just want to to see if any one of you would like to pick up on what you heard from the other speakers before I maybe uh, uh, shoehorn us into a specific conversation. But is there anyone you who would like to pick up on? Um, would you've heard from the other speakers that uh, kind of resonated for your work as well? Maybe I can pick up on Nelson Marie because I really think that it's uh, it shows a beautiful picture of when someone gets uh, realized the societal problem and puts forces together to create a systematic change to that by putting up systems that is not in place in society uh, as is, and then what it shows is like the core and the strength of civil society and innovative people and how big uh, impact you can have when uh, uh, cooperating towards uh, a societal change which yeah creates a safety net for women it's really inspiring to hear thanks Sophia Kavya I saw you were also um you, go ahead yeah, um, I want to actually uh, add to what Sophia was talking about, you know, the importance of working with boys and men. And I just wanted to reiterate what she was saying from our context, that, you know, especially in a country where patriarchy is the key, and, you know, it's so inherently embedded in everything, um, and where it gives boys and men this power. I mean, I'm, I'm not even saying that they're like the saviors or the perpetrators, but just them as individuals, they've been given this power, which is often misused and misguided. So working with them and creating this common understanding on solidarity is so important. And also recognizing that, you know, even when you talk about patriarchy, it's not always that women and girls are on the receiving end. It is a uh, boys and men as well I mean you can't cry you have to do a certain kind of work you have to earn for the family there are so many more things so it is just refreshing to hear that you know. yeah so I'd like to add that you know when we talk about uh, sexuality gender sex uh, patriarchy violence these are not terms that uh, people are familiar with uh, most people don't even know what they mean or how they are impacting their lives and um, therefore we advocate for education quality education uh, from a very young age and at all levels including um, you know, in every institution. So we have to constantly upskill ourselves in um, helping us understand and navigate through these uh, terms and these spaces. Uh, what we have been told um, that by, you know, being able to label their experience, they've actually got a vocabulary for what they have been through. And having the data really helps you unpack why is it happening? Because often when you speak up and you're brave enough to speak up for yourself, the spotlight turns back on you to say that it was your fault, you caused it to happen, you were wrong, wearing the wrong clothing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you can show that it is part of a larger system of violence and a culture of violence, then uh, people are put on the spot and uh, they have to think through whether they would like to live in such a violent society. We are all under this misguided notion that we live in peaceful societies, but it's not true. And these stories clearly showcase the pain and the trauma that the person experiencing it goes through. Whilst there's no naming, shaming and blaming, we do want to encourage all genders to use our crowd map, but work with their communities to solve the problem. And whilst the sol you know, solving the problem, I don't know whether it will be solved in my lifetime, but we can work with institutional authorities to strengthen the systems to respond to these kind of uh, uh, social, harmful, so harmful social norms and stereotypes. 
uh, strengthen the response mechanisms and redressal, uh, you know, pathways for survivors and also educate people as to what is appropriate and inappropriate and in many uh, cases a crime because they are not aware of it. So where we talk about men and boys, we don't assume that all of them are perpetrators, but many of them are silent bystanders. So how can we get them more involved to take action? Again, because there's a silence around the issue, there's not enough data and information, they, um, they claim that they didn't know about it. They, do, they are not aware of it. And therefore the crowd map in a way makes visible um, these incidents and put people on the spot to actually do something. Yeah, I think one other thing that's quite important, Sophia mentioned that um, when, especially in our scenarios where it's a lot patriarchal, that we seem to also develop maybe the girls, uh, the women, and we leave behind the men in empowering them and in bringing them on board. And sometimes we found that it's misinterpreted by the men, especially leaders who are like, oh no, what are you doing? Because it's, it's not a, the environment is no longer favorable for them. So we need to also ensure that we are doing equally to empower the men too, and let them know how this is bringing everybody to a common ground. It's going to be fair on everyone. Um, that empowering women is not disempowering men, or it shouldn't be a disadvantage to men. We find when women um, now have their own businesses and they're going out, it spurs sometimes more GPV. When they leave relationships, they look badly and say, oh, now the women have businesses that were better off when they were disadvantaged. But no, now it's an opportunity where now in a relationship, let's say we're a man and a woman in our community, now it's, it's, it's helping both of them to, to have better livelihoods as a family. But it's looked at now that, oh no, now she's going to leave or go elsewhere. So it, it adds more to GPV in, especially in our Southern Africa uh, settings that, oh, now that women are empowered, they are not too happy about it. So these balances need to come in, empower both men, empower both women, empower both whatever um, agenda one is affiliating with and make sure that everybody's interconnecting and networking so that we are all happy with the results. Thanks, Vera. And I'll post um, maybe one question that we can sit with. And at the same time, I will encourage the audience now to share their thoughts in the chat as well. So we'll take maybe a, a few few minutes of um, just um, I'll share some music and uh, encourage everyone in the audience to share. And um, I'll pose a question and, you know, the audience, please feel free to share any of your reflections of what you have heard so far. Um, but one of the questions I would love to hear then um, when we come back from um, our our panelists or from our speakers is about networks and solidarity building across countries, across boundaries, across contexts, while at the same time keeping the local specificity in place. And the reason why I'm asking about this is that there is this kind of tension, I think, a lot in feminist activism around, you know, um, respecting and giving agency to local actors and the local context while at the same time creating this kind of a global movement or a global um, spotlight on gender inequality which we kind of assume to be global but at the same time with such local specificities whether it is also because as we spoke about before in terms of other issues let's say religion caste coming into play there being a lot of power dynamics between global south and global north so how do we use networks and collab collaborations what is your experience as being part of international spaces and navigating this kind of challenging working together but being at the same time on the local level so it's a big question um so um i'll i'll now then encourage everyone from the audience um to put your reflections in. Um, we'll take a few moments and then we'll come to pick up on those.
Thank you so much for um, your questions and your inputs. Um, I heard my wonderful music. I realized nobody else could hear it. So hopefully you were sing or singing to yourselves to, to, to keep a little bit of that sound. But um, we will now come together um, again. And so I guess um, first to offer the space to any of the panelists to um, reflect on either what you've seen in the chat um, or um, if you want to speak to the, to the question around kind of global co collaboration or uh, cross-border collaboration for gender equity and the kind of local, local element. Um, but feel free to respond to anything you've seen in the chat as well. Um, I can go first. So here, a couple of themes are emerging. One is power, uh, power structures, collective action. And in social issues, many social issues, let alone gender inequality, there is an information asymmetry because the ordinary citizen does not have access to data information or in any kind of information to hold the powers that be accountable, right? Collective action is very important because again, accountability from institutions can only be driven through a collective action approach. Um, you know, most of the major legislative changes or changes in the world have happened because of collective action driven by civil society. So including the current climate action and, um, you know, so therefore, to uh, the question specifically posed by Brendan, um, which is uh, how can networks be leveraged to amplify spread and make sense of that knowledge? First of all, all of us must realize that as individuals or as organizations, we cannot solve any of the social issues of our time. They are just too big. So we should have collective action and we should collaborate. And uh, radical collaboration is something that I came across early last year. And I think it's very important. E you know, radical collaboration is with col is collaboration and partnership with organizations that you would not normally partner with. And the idea being we need innovative thinking, we need out of the box action as well, because what is status quo is just not working, right? So, in the case of Safe City, it's very simple. Uh, the platform is global, it's anonymous. Anyone, anywhere can use it for free. The information is open source because once it's approved at the back end, it's published, and that published information can be accessed open source again for free. So it's not only the use of the platform, but also the data that is available. Uh, and that data is very actionable in your own local context. Now, then, you talk about the local part. Every, and I put it down there in the chat, that uh, what we've seen in the data is that the nature of violence is very different in every city, in every country, within a city. And so having those hyper-local trends is very, very critical. And then the second part again comes back to the community because what is it that you want to do with that data? And we are always fascinated with the responses that emerge because everybody wants to do something different. And it doesn't always have to be policing in terms of violence. Hmm. It could be street art, it could be theater, it could be uh, representation uh, to the police or civic authorities, but it could also mean uh, working with authorities to release budgets for specific things, again, determined by the community. So the, the number of responses can be varied, and it's really up to the community to drive it. And for me, that is more sustainable in the long run. Thanks so much, Elsa. Yeah. Yeah, um, can I just, yes, can I just come in? Um, especially also touching on uh, Dennis's question about how can we in Africa expand on, on without just looking at empowering women and girls for the gender inequalities. I think the, the international networks help a lot because when you are in your own local context, you know what you know, and there are a lot of barriers. So learning from other countries on what they have done, expanding the network. Some countries have, have, have grown in some areas in advance, especially looking at India, they still have some patriarchal, but then also in other regions where they have really 
uh, improved. So that's where the international networks come in, not just uh, networking amongst our own uh, locals because we know what we know in our own contexts, but um, also like Elsa Marie mentioned, you know, uh, leadership, taking a collective action is really required. Um, and global, having, for example, your, your, your men engaged from Sofia, having them also shout out when our local leaders see that this is how other countries are moving, the direction that they are moving towards. It helps them to also think and change. It changes things at those international levels within their like treaties or, or, or other things that are ratified that help to, to re, they help us. So internationally and all those networks, they help us. And it really comes down to the individual on the ground. So those things are very important and networks and the advocacy that is done for, especially gender inequalities. Once we start talking, once we start sharing, and once these things get onto those bigger platforms, it makes a real significant difference to us. Thanks, Vera. Sophia, would you be able to come in? How does it, what are your experiences uh, both regionally in Europe and then I guess as part of the global network? Yes, so I mean, I, I find this uh, question and like uh, approach to the conversation very interesting because that is obviously something that is core when working with a network that covers so many different contexts. And I guess what we uh, try to emphasize is that um, the activities on, on the ground and the international solidarity should be based on the uh, identified local needs by the local actors. So it's accountability from the grassroots level uh, where they see what kind of interventions that will be most useful and most powerful. We can't come in and decide that on someone else's behalf. So it has to be done in close collaboration with the local context itself. And uh, also with accountability towards all the feministic and women's rights organizations. I mean, especially when working with men, what we do is all, um, in its core to try to uh, encourage and amplify the work of feministic organizations by in engaging men towards the same direction. Um, but like I have a concrete maybe example, which uh, could be seen in when Turkey withdraw from the Istanbul Convention, uh, and then our Turkish members uh, used our platform on the regional European level, but also on the global level to increase awareness about it on an international base, to inform of what kind of actions that are needed and to discuss that uh, both on an individual level, but also uh, as an outreach and advocacy platform. And I guess that is where uh, being part of an international and or global network is the strength because it really, it, it's a megaphone towards a bigger audience, but it has to be driven from the local uh, actors themselves in collaboration with your allies, including those networks that can make it facilitate the process or like strengthen the outreach of it. Uh, and another example is uh, we have members who work with like as psychologists to like victims of domestic violence, for instance, and so on. And we have one man that I remember lives in Albania and they also face a lot of backlashes currently and sometimes what he needs is just to like ventilate and discuss with people who also see that yes there is an issue and to explain what is ongoing in his local context to people he needs and then realize similarities and differences to other contexts that the, there is not an isolated matter but this is a global concern and faced by all women and all men across the globe and everyone have to be involved in it. Thanks, Sophia. And I think that's so important. I think also when we when we kind of realize that there is no kind of a linear progression, that we see the backsliding of, of gender equity and equality in parts of the world where a lot of us in the feminist circles thought the fight has been won, right? And there was that kind of assumption that you know, it is probably more of an issue in some parts of the world than others, but actually, as you're saying, it is everyone's concern because the, the backsliding is definitely happening. And I think that kind of 
also the ability to say to certain countries where these, you know, US being the most current example where we're seeing this kind of, I guess, potential um, attack on uh, sexual and reproductive rights for women, this kind of idea that, you know, it will have ripple effects because of this global, um, you know, connections that we have in terms of gender equity um, uh, fights. But I don't know, for example, Kavya, are you a member um, as an organization of India-based uh, coalitions on issues of gender equity? How does it work in terms of collaborating in that space? So there are a lot of networks which my organization is part of, the team members are part of. And I think um, it's mostly just bringing different women together and girls together and providing them with opportunities. Because as we're talking about, you know, local voices, them being important. And us as just facilitators giving them space and also just I feel like you know uh, because this conversation about power uh, really stuck with me and just making everyone realize even us as facilitators and the girls and boys in the field that power is not static power moves we all I mean I could have some power in the morning someone else could have it at night I mean Beverly has power over all of us right now because all the tech is in her hand but then maybe in the evening, someone else has power over her. So just realizing that power moves, power can be used for ourselves, and it's really important. And um, if it's okay, I really want to touch on the sustainability. Because, um, I mean, about sustainability, imagine these girls who have barely been able to get some education. Now they have to go out to work or to... Um, they're just married off. They do not have access to uh, the, the digital space, any devices or internet. Sustainability there is really difficult. So what Vera said about you know the WhatsApp group, recognizing that even that is a huge achievement uh, to be able to, you know to be able to get these girls on one platform is a very big uh, achievement. And how we need to have a multi pronged approach because. You know, we need resources, then maybe we'll be able to get them cell phones and internet, but then we also need to uh, advocate. So advocacy is really important. Activism is really important because you still need to convince their parents, their fathers and their brothers that, you know what, when we give them the phone, let the girls have the phone. Do not take away their phone. So it's a very multi-pronged approach when you're working in uh, with communities which are marginalized in multiple ways. What is it that's important? Thanks, Kavya. And, and I'm afraid that because of the time, we won't necessarily have the space to, to continue the conversation much further. And, uh, and I think it, we could be here for hours. And I think, as, as Elsa said, we don't know if we will see in our lifetime some of the changes we, we do, do hope. But, um, you know, especially working uh, in the space to create the foundation so that maybe the next um, uh, generations will, will, be, will be able to see the society that we want. So, um, I will at this point have to thank um, our panelists for all of your thoughts and um, uh, reflections and comments and um, experiences. Uh, but also to highlight the fact that this is not the end of the, the conversation. It is the end right now, but um, as the part of the entire Enact um, uh, festival, we're hoping that it is a catalyst for further conversations. Um, we will be following up with recordings of this session if you want to come back to this. Uh, we will be, you know, uh, promoting uh, further collaborations. And so if you are interested in being uh, part of these conversations, um, you will have seen in the chat a few suggestions of communities you can join, including our own um, uh, Nexus. So um, uh, at this point, I would just encourage you to stay in touch and continue the conversation uh, with us and with one another. And so as we as we um, uh, log off, uh, I would uh, love to see from from everyone, um, uh, from our audience members, uh, a one takeaway that you hope um, to take with you um, uh, as a result of the conversation that you heard today. So whether it is in the next three months or in a short period of time, what is it something that you can do in your own work, in your community, um, uh, that kind of was inspired by our speakers. So um, as you leave those things in the chat, I thank you very much. I think uh, our speakers, once again, it was such a pleasure to have you and look forward to further conversations. Um, so thank you everyone. Uh, have a good rest of your days. Bye, take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.
Thanks Vera for the takeaway. Thanks everyone else who can put them in. Brilliant. Thank you everyone. Um, take care.